So everybody, thank you for being here today. I'm the curator at the Sheldon Jackson Museum, Jackie Fernandez Hamburg. And this is the second to last event in the Friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum Winter Share Your Culture, Share Your Research series, which has been a wonderful series of Zoom events. We invited people to submit their proposal. And Richards was very exciting and also very heartfelt. It was such a pleasure to talk to him on the phone about what he wanted to share with us today, a couple of months back. So I'm so thrilled that he accepted the invitation to be here and we're grateful for him for sharing his story and also his mother's story. Um, so first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on traditional Klingit land. We're very grateful to be guests here on that land. And I'd like to begin with a short introduction just to share a little bit of biographical information about Richard. And also I should mention, um, thank you to his wife for assisting. She's here and present too. So Richard Jackson comes from a rich heritage by following his mother's side in the Tongas Klingat and his father's side in the Klingat Kaguantan. Richard is a hereditary Kitsati clan leader for his tribal clan, the Tantaquan Tequiti of Ketchikan. Richard joined the Alaska Native Brotherhood in 1981 and has served as local president and then grand president for three terms. Richard is now the a and grand president emeritus. He's a veteran of the Vietnam War and Korean conflict serving three tours of duty on the USS Coral Sea from 1967 to 71. During his three tours, Richard received seven medals, including the National Defense Service Medal, Vietnam Service Medal, Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal, Navy Unit Commendation to awards, including a silver star, Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal with a star, Meritorious Unit Citation Ribbon, Battle E Medal, and Vietnam Gallantry Cross. In 1987, Richard helped his Tongass tribe revitalize the Chief Johnson totem pole after they obtained funding to have it carved and raised with the traditional Klingit celebration, which was the first time in the last century to occur in Ketchikan. Richard currently leads the revitalization of his Tongass Klingit people by incorporating and heading up the Tongass Klingit Cultural Heritage Institute, which hosted its first Esther Shea Native Arts Culture Camp in 2019 and again in 2020, where youth learned Klingit form line design, regalia making, drum making, plant harvesting, and Klingit language. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Richard Jackson. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. That's, uh, attending to Zoom meeting uh, or conference. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, friends of Sheldon Jackson Museum Board of Directors, and those that have uh, initiated this um, series of uh, discussions and really thought they were well done. Uh, thank you, Jackie, for uh, contacting me. And uh, we, we uh, thought it would be nice to, to put a little discussion about the people that we are from, but mainly about my mother, Esther Shea. My mother uh, went to Sheldon Jackson when she was in grade school. And uh, at that time, the, there was a colonialism that was uh, discouraging language being spoken. And my mother was uh, uh, stopped from speaking clink at, in the school we put in a meditation room, they called it, and so she would uh, not speak the language again. But she spoke it when she went home uh, to my grandmother, my grandmother, uh, my mother's name was Tuck, Tuck Ye, and my grandmother, which means son coming out of a basket. And my grandmother, which is Alice Harris or Alice Brown, her father's name was Shaw Clan on the Kanskati side. And her name was Kakan, and she made sure my mother uh, learned everything that she could about the Tonda Kwan Tekwe D. So when I grew up in uh, Ketchikan, uh, I, 
I attended some of the events, mostly uh, parties back in the 50s. They weren't done very often. So when I attended them, they were either at the Sacme AB Hall where we live or at the Redmond Hall. I mean, the um, uh, not the Redmond Hall, uh, Elks Hall in Ketchikan. I remember one there that was really a traditional. We'll see a picture or two that my grandmother did. And uh, later on, my mother, uh, uh, after my grandmother passed away in 1966, she started carrying on, uh, began the language actually in preschool at the Methodist Church in Ketchikan. She was doing uh, uh, one of the teachers there that was asked to teach the young kids uh, something about the Clinket uh, culture. And she, she did that with them prior to when she got into uh, Ketchikan Indian uh, Corporation, as it was called now, it's called Ketchikan Indian Community. Under the Johnson O'Malley Act, there was a great funding that happened and there was upsurge in uh, Clinket had in Simpson knowledge that was passed on before the elders left in the 70s. And the prime mover of that in Ketchikan was um, Ed Thomas. He was uh, deeply involved in making sure that these languages were preserved. And when they built the uh, Ketchikan Indian Community 429 building, it was it with A uh, and B who owned the land, uh, adding a, a, a hall in the bottom to make sure that A and B continued and the languages and the arts were continued every week with all the nations that were here, which primarily are Klinkahayan and Simpsonian. So my mother taught there, and later on she went to um, to wanted to teach in school, and they wanted her to teach in school, so she had to get a degree. Uh, to do that. So she went to Sheldon Jackson. Her and uh, I think Irma Lawrence is one of the other ones who I uh, hold in high regard. At, uh, uh, I believe she's from Kassan or where Fred is from when he's here. Very good friend of mine. And she, she talked to me as a, as a um, uh, relative to her husband. His her husband was Cogwanton from the same house my dad was from. So she always treated me with great uh, Great, great respect. My mother uh, went to Sheldon Jackson and she finally got a degree and she started teaching in uh, KIC and in, in high school and then later in college. And following that, um, from all the events she was doing, she had three dance groups. She taught uh, at the Ketchikan uh, Heritage Center. Uh, a lot of classes while she was doing all those things and, and started those three dance groups. In the meantime, she was doing a lot of uh, language writing. She has booklets that were done with Sheldon Jackson and KIC. And uh, she also um, uh, held uh, uh, traditional classes with our, our tribe so that we would not forget what we, we were taught uh, when we were young. And she uh, had an emphasis on regalia. And uh, we'll show you some of that later on. And then uh, eventually uh, she was named the first uh, cultural bearer of the Alaska Federation of Natives, which uh, I'm really proud of that. And so um, she kept on uh, teaching and she was busy teaching all the way into her eighties. And uh, she traveled a little, she went to uh, Japan we went to England. She traveled to Canada extensively. We went to a party over in uh, Alert Bay, which is where some of our family is, to, to Chief Ebbets and his daughter, Mary Ebbets. Uh, her family's down there. We acknowledge that, the Hunt family. And uh, it was always exciting. We went to uh, 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 Canada, Canada up to the Yukon and uh, to Tedlin for another uh, event that happened. And later on, we started with uh, uh, some of the A&B members. We had helped Andy Hope start the first think uh, conference that they still continue up in Haines, Alaska. So my mother was involved in that and kept kept on traveling and doing things together. And uh, eventually we went, to, we, we even went to the um, Goodwill Games uh, in Seattle and did a a part with the uh, different tribes down there. They were all from all over the place. They had four circles for, for four areas and Alaska was pretty big. 
that was a lot of fun. So after my mother passed away, uh, we, we were looking at how can we convey uh, uh, what she has taught us to not only our tribal members, uh, traditional tribal members, but those who are interested. So we started uh, talking, uh, we got a hold of my sister-in-law, Gail, who's here. We went to Juneau and we applied for a nonprofit for the state of Alaska. So we did that and we got a, we got a, some money from, uh, uh, I think it was uh, like the height of the first money we got and had a, had a, a 19, a 2019 uh, Esther Shea cultural camp. And we'll show some pictures of that. Then we went a step further working with uh, uh, her, uh, and, and, and Priscilla Schulte to, to get nonprofit status through the IRS. And we did get that. We went and got uh, funding through, through the help of Gail again with uh, BIA uh, archeology, span I think it is, uh, for funding for a project we want to do in the future. We got funding from Awesome and we got funding from see Alaska. And so we're off and running. We're a small little group, but we'll, we'll start beginning our strategic planning this year and do some other projects. We're looking to do a cultural project in the summer, probably a camp. A lot of our kids are, are not familiar with the culture. So we it's really a good, good project. We do in a day to do regalia with my mother-in-law, uh, Jerry Brown and with my brother who did form line, Norman Jackson and Nathan Jackson also worked on that. We had uh, Virginia Oliver from Wrangell work on the language and uh, I had help with my sister as well for language, Martha Danny. So we're continuing on with these different projects. We have a, a little slideshow that we'd like to show you about some of the events that happened in the Ketchikan area. Um, my wife is the co-host. So that's the Trishé Natives Arts Institute in Ketchikan that uh, falls as a subcategory of uh, Tonga's cultural, Kinka Cultural Heritage Institute. You'll notice that Tonga's Kinka Cultural Heritage Institute doesn't say Tonga's traditional tribe. It's inclusive of what we do, those that are interested, depending on the grant. So we've got limited grant so far, but it's inclusive. Anyone who applies that wants to apply, it's in the, in the category that we have them in, which are mostly children right now. So we thought that would be a very good start for continuing my mother's uh, work. Um, still looking at the books and catalog cataloging your books. If you heard that uh, Ketchikan uh, UAS had a, had a sprinkler that went off and all the books were, were, were uh, got wet, but we got our, our books donated to us from Priscilla Shulkley, the director of, me, of the, the campus prior to that. So we're pretty fortunate we have all these books and uh, they're real historical in nature. And I have lots lots in my basement, which I need to catalog. But uh, we uh, came, came together in 2019 and uh, 20. 19, 19 was a hands-on, everybody was there. And uh, uh, 20, uh, 2020 was on the internet on Zoom and it was our free ex first experience. And it was really challenging, but uh, we've been learning a lot more on it and uh, with the help of uh, the people that use it, including uh, friends of museum, our Shelly Jack Museum have been helpful with us. So this is just the beginning right here. We'll move on to the next slide. This is a very special picture. In 1868, uh, Edward Mybridge went up, went to Tongass Island. He was uh, he came up, he was sponsored, I believe, by the uh, Department of Revenue, which was its, at that time, Department of War. I could be wrong, but he came with him with funded to catalog the uh, the, the, the tribes in the, the area. And uh, the first stop was in. Tongas Island, Fort Tongas. And these are my relatives. Uh, I really hold this in high regard because this is the first, first picture ever taken in Alaska. And it was the takeaway deed from Tonda Kwan. 
Uh, Tom the Kwan means the sea lion people. And uh, under them was, uh, of course, we two clans that still now are active are the Tequidi from Katsit and the Gonskadi Yan uh, Hit, which is the Drifting Ashore House. So this could be either the Tongas tribe bear clan or it's, it's the in laws on either side, meaning the husbands and wives, and the wives could be Raven, I would say, from the Ganakari, and their husband would be in the back, I would think, or this could be the, the clan, but I'm thinking it's the, the, the whole family, meaning both sides. And uh, they're very, I really like this picture because I could see my grandmother's uh, features in a lot of these people. This was in 1868, and my grandma was born in 1876, so this was a uh, like eight years before my grandmother was born. And you see in the middle of the picture, there's a guy in, in, in a suit. And he was the entrepreneur of the island. He did a go, go between between the, the soldiers and there was like about 50 of them on the island uh, with a little uh, fort that, that was on the other side of the island. It was a, was a small island. And they were there for only two years from 1868 to 1870, meaning the, the, the fort for the, for the soldier, then they left. And if you notice, when you look at these houses, they're not traditional looking. The reason why is uh, our, our people went up to up, up Portland Canal to, to uh, Port Stewart or Stewart BC now. And they traded up there and they got uh, goods from, uh, from the towns, small towns that were there. They traded with the, the uh, Simpsons for for uh, foods and particularly the gold one was that we hold in real hold high regard was the Nass River grease and uh, very good. I you know I, I really like it today. And uh, they traded uh, with uh, probably fur. They did a lot of hunting. And at that time there was silver fox all over the place here. A lot of a lot of uh, sea lions. There's a lot of beaver and, and things that they traded for, and they traded for uh, clothes and uh, uh, bead items and regalia making foodstuffs and probably uh, pots and pans and things that were changing at that time. And you see uh, two of those guys are wearing army coats, the one on the right side and the one in the middle left next to the guy in their Western suit. That's probably a trade with the, the, the army that was on the island at the time. So they have their traditional bear hats, which I, I have one, I always wear it. And, uh, and right behind, right in front of the pole, there's a man in a white uh, shirt and long hair. And he's a, he's a or a shaman because only they, they had long hair, real long hair. And, uh, I just really enjoy this picture because there are a couple pictures, but this one is the one that my family is in it. I can look at it every time I want to and just really feel uh, blessed that I was able to see it. And this is a, another one of those pictures that was taken. Uh, uh, you could see uh, these are uh, just, there was lots of trading. There was no uh, uh, disturbance between the, the, the fort and to, to tribe because it's evident they have guns. They hunted with these guns. And there was, a, they had, a, we had been to, have been to Tongas Island. They had a nice white beach with a lot of shell and a little uh, a cove there that they can land their canoes on. And it was just a protected place. Uh, the Tongas tribe traveled a lot. They'd been uh, in a lot of places. And at that time from, from before Tongas Island, they were at Village Island and Cat Island. And then prior to that, they were at, uh, the exact times are unknown, but they were at uh, Takaani, which is uh, in that island. That was their village before the migration of the Simpsian. And they came up in 1887 and they procured uh, the island as a reservation in 1891 when uh, Duncan went to Washington and got that changed. Anyway, we were already gone from there. We're moving. And, and, and earlier on, we lived on Prince of Wales and uh, Prince of Wales uh, is shaped like, uh, we, we said, like the head of a sea line. Um, that's, uh, that was where the Tondaquan was. 
in Moray Bay, and we had lived in Duke Island for, uh, and then prior to when we went to Net Island, and then all, all the way over to uh, finally to Tongas. And then we moved to uh, Ketchikan. There was a camp there that was uh, used, and it was they were building uh, clan houses there be, because they had water. Uh, Tongas Island did not have water, there was a well there. And so the question is, why did, were they on Tongas Island? Because of the conflicts that were occurring. Uh, and not, not only were we had some conflicts with uh, different nations, uh, not so much uh, uh, our friends uh, that are today in Alaska, but with uh, Canadians on uh, prim primarily the, the uh, Shmogut, you know, they were just uh, localized problems they had, so they traveled a lot. And, uh, Eventually, uh, that was resolved, and uh, we intermarried with uh, uh, lots of the Simpsons on, on uh, Net Island or, or Malakatla. Okay. Well, once we uh, left the island, we went to uh, Tongas Island. We went to Ketchikan Creek, which is where there were houses, there was the reason why was it was because of the creek was full of fish and was plenty of water. So we were there and uh, this picture you, you see here is about 1900 or 1901, I think, uh, because that, that was around the time that the Johnson pole was put up. And you see that walkway there, that was prior to when they built a road, it was all walkway. And eventually they built a bridge there, which we see today. And it's been there since I think the 40s or the 30s. I don't know exactly when. But those were little houses and there were clan houses. There were also houses on the other side of the bridge uh, from different uh, clans, uh, primarily the Tequidi and, and the uh, Kanakari. And when we were on Tonga Island, we had to, uh, the um, Tukluwadi too, the killer whales, uh, they migrated and I was heard they went to Canada and the last I heard from one of our, our people, he heard them telling stories about they had been down here in, in uh, Whitehorse, which I find real surprising. But this was before Ketchikan was really uh, built up. You see way over in the corner, that's where they start to building up to, uh, to the town. And, Unfortunately, later on, the, the town got built around the, 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 the tribe and they turned around in, uh, in the early 1900s and started uh, the town. They, they got some native allotments for the families and there's not any of those uh, that are active now. There may be one or two that have not been uh, sold, but I've seen that noted in the books in Ketchikan, but it was a lot of native allotments and some of them were up by, uh, Park Avenue, which is a, a lot of the Simpsons that moved here and the downtown was mostly Tongas and then also Tongas and Cape Foxer and Saxman. Okay. This is uh, Chief Johnson. And I don't know who is standing next to him. Uh, I know a story on that my mother told me was uh, Chief Johnson got the position of the, of the young Kishi hit house leader when George McKay, uh, who was uh, in line to be the leader, went to Sitka Training School, which is where he learned a trade, and he became a Christian and he turned down the position. So Johnson got it. And the pole that you see there is a, is a story, which it's, it's of the fog woman. And my mother has told that story. It's, it's written. I would take too long to tell the story, but it's called the, you could, they call it the Chief Johnson pole, but it is a really called the Kajuk pole, the Golden Eagle pole, because right on top of it is an eagle. Uh, although it, down below it's the raven, because it's, it's a story of, you know, what, what the, the, the crick was and the, the mystique of, of, a, of our relationship with the Ketchikan area. And the crick itself, or Ketchikan, is a uh, sun rain wings are under the wings of an eagle. That's what it, it's, uh, the story it is. There are a couple other uh, ideas about that, but that's the most um, used. 
So there, when my mother said there was a big rock in the creek, and uh, when it got really rainy, that would spray out like in uh, like wings. So that was uh, one of the thoughts on that. Okay. Another picture of a, um, you'll see in this picture, Johnson Pole again. Um, that's in 1901. So uh, that was a local, uh, I, I think that's a tourist factory. I, that's what I think it is. They, come to, they came to catch candy and went to look at the, the pole that was there. And uh, later on, when I, when I was born, um, there were lots of poles in Ketchikan were put up by the city. They, now they're not there. They were around the park. Some of you might remember, like Fred Olson. They, they had a lot of poles up from, from uh, Simtian as well as Haida and, and Tongas. And uh, all the other poles, uh, uh, they went, got put up and carved during the CCC. Some of them were Haida and Simtian uh, out at Mud Bite and uh, uh, in Saxman. But this is a, yeah, this is where the tourists may have been coming and looking at the pole, okay? Side view, and you can see the, the, uh, the clan house, it's Johnson's house. And, and you can you can see that there, there are commercial buildings behind us, but we're getting slowly encroached on by, because of the value of the land and because of timber and uh, we, if you don't, you have, you don't know this. Uh, the natives didn't have citizenship till about 1922 or 23 when William Paul put, got on a case with Charlie Jones from from your ankle, his his, uh, his family Tilly Paul, who was uh, Francis Paul's mother, uh, wife, and William Paul's mother, and Louis Paul. So Louis Paul, Paul took a real big interest in this trial because. He voted and he didn't uh, forego his native culture and they said he committed a crime and it was a felony. And he, he came to Ketchikan and it was ruled uh, out of order and it was, he was a citizen. We got, so we were under the acts that was preexisted, uh, preconditions that existed, they were wrong and uh, we became citizens prior to the Native Americans down south by two years because of that trial. and. Uh, William Paul uh, was really uh, a, ch a child of a take D. He also had another trial for schools in the area when uh, Eddie Jones Ellison was uh, allowed to go to school because the school was, uh, was, had been uh, trying to prevent their children from going to school, but they, they, they found that the school had a room to where they would go and they couldn't prevent that. So there's a lot of activity that happened in this area that I'm pretty proud of. And uh, anyway, uh, we'll move on. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, the new pole. My, my brother, uh, Israel Shotridge, or that's his name he uses, but his actual name is Howard Jackson, if you want to know. He carved the pole in uh, uh, 1989. We put it up uh, downtown. And, it was a 55 foot pole and man, that was a big pole. How we had to get an hour's worth of insurance for a million bucks. So we didn't clock somebody and they get hurt and then we'd be sued. Anyway, we got the pole done on the deadline. It was actually the night before we were still, they were still painting and they, they looking at those wings. They did one side twice and they had to recarve it that night and, and uh, paint it before the next day. And they were really hurrying. They had a hair, hair dryer to dry the paint and get it done in time. Then we had a problem because it was such a big pole. So we had, was a Navy ship in town that was uh, passing through Ketchikan. So they stopped for Liberty. I'm, I'm a Navy guy myself. We got the Navy to come out with their all their guys. We got those uh, big uh, eight by eights, I guess it was their big uh, cedar to put under the pole and lift it and carry it over to where we we're gonna raise it. We had to stop a number of times with the rest and under pilings and, and we got it up. And uh, that was our, my mother composed a song of, called The Bear Stands Up to say the bear has come out of their den, they're, they've become active again. They want to let you know they're here. So we worked with our in-laws to get that pole up and, and uh, Actually, Robin Taylor was instrumental in getting the funding for the state and passed through the city so that they, they could uh, manage the money. Okay. Uh, 
That's my grandmother, <clears throat> Ka Ken. This is back in the 1950s at the Elks Hall. Elks Hall is not any longer here in Ketchikan. And those are the elders that were alive back in the 1950s. George Keegan is over in the corner there with a kilo oil vest on. I know that's George, or it could be Joe Johnson, or, but I, I think it's George because of his glasses. We claim the kilo oil as well. See my grandmother is wearing a kilo oil fan hat. Uh, she was a, a high esteem. I, I, I know this simply because uh, she had tattoos. She had a tattoo on one of her arms. She said her uncle had done it and a partially done one on the other. She didn't get it done because she was too painful. She didn't get it finished. Because uh, she was just a little girl when they did that. And she was uh, over on Tungus Island, born in... 1876, and then they moved to Ketchikan, I believe, in uh, uh, 1892 or somewhere in that area. So this party is uh, happening because uh, I can recognize the steps. And, uh, it was done very uh, carefully. I don't know who the party was for, but uh, my grandmother was doing a, uh, one of her songs or dances. She's wearing a chill cap blanket and uh, my grandma uh, was 86 when she passed away in 1966, I believe it was. And uh, anyway, uh, we did uh, our party with, uh, with the Cape Fox. They came invited and the Haidas that we knew in town that came over that were in our family. So this is a, a, of the earlier that times that I remember. Here's my mother, and she is in Ketchikan Museum. And she worked there for years. She loved to make regalia. And she had a really good sense of humor, really witty. And uh, she would tell us stories. And one of the true stories she told me I, I thought was really cute was that she's on Tonga Sound when the sailing ships came in, they brought in goods. So they were trading in furs and things and the ladies really did the trading. The men stood back and the head ladies did the trading. I want you guys to know that. And if they, they, they didn't agree to the price, they'd negotiate with each other and come up with a better price. Anyway, the, the sailors uh, gifted the tribe with a pig, little baby pig. And they thought, well, wonder what this is. So they decided not to uh, eat the pig. They made the pig a pet, a pet. And the pig was so loved on the island that they let it run freely through the village because they're pretty smart. They're smarter than dogs. And when the time came, they named the pig, gave it a, a, a native name. And then it died, they mourned for the pig and had a party. And that was pretty cute. My mom told us about that. It was true. It was true. They just, they just liked that little pig. And my mom, she learned to drive when she was 71 because her husband, second husband, uh, Cliff Shea passed away and she wanted to learn to go places. She didn't want to be sitting at home. So she learned to drive. And then one winter, my, my, my sister said to my, my mother, you better move the car. It's going to get snowed in on the driveway. So, so my, my sister heard a thump and went outside and she drove the car in the yard. <laughs> And my sister said, how'd you get the car in the yard? And she was, in, you know, she was in shock and to call my brother and my brother said, "Why, well, you know, better call the Pioneer home on this one. You're getting starting to lose it. And my mother really worried about it, but he never called the Pioneer home. And she would drive around town and everybody was worried about it because she learned so late in life. And she got around and she did uh, a lot of artwork and uh, um, told him heritage and that's one of the ones I see that she did with fur, which uh, she had done a lot of all my regalia and I keep an eye on it. Cause I'll send on to the, my, the one I gifted to or, or just leave it with the tribe to use as their Atu. So in the back, you see one of Nathan's uh, uh, panels that he put up at the Totem area. That's how come I know it's there. And uh, we'll move on to the next slide. 
That's me. That's I. I'm on Tongass Island. When I went to Tongass Island with my with the Priscilla Schulte and my brother Willie was there, and a couple other people, I can't recall the names. Um, it was very, very moving because this is the place where my ancestors come from. This is the place they were traditional prior to when they had to go to Ketchikan. I believe there was pressure for them to go to, to get their kids in school. And that came from, you know, that's why uh, Francis Paul and Samuel Jackson, or Samuel, Samuel Saxman, I'm sorry, Samuel Saxman and the native guy they went looking for a site for a school near Ketchikan. And uh, they, they drowned in. William Paul's dad drowned in. Um, he ended up um, naming Saxman after him. And they built a school there. And that still exists today. That's at their city hall. If you ever go by the city hall, I remember playing there. And when I was a little boy, there was chalkboards. And I used to go up into the bell and ring it. And they still had the little desk and things that they had there. And uh, we went to, we were going to public school by then. So uh, everything was integrated. And, uh, but we still, we still were able to look at that, that hall. And as a matter of fact, the 429 building in Ketchikan was on the, the BIA school that they had in Ketchikan before they integrated. And even after they integrated school, the BIA still had the school in Ketchikan for a while. There were teachers that taught there. Uh, one of the main third ladies taught there as well, or Johnson, I think it was. So we'll move on to the next picture. Here's my brother Wooly, day one. And he's a he's a veteran like me. He was in the uh, 82nd Airborne. I was there in 68, 69, and 70, and, and he was there in 69 in the army and I was worried about him because I was on a ship. We, uh, we guarded the coast and we flew missions to protect the, the, the sites that were with the army and the Marine Corps war, along with the Air Force. And so, but while he was there, I was really deeply concerned about how he was doing and he made it out okay. And, and we came back to Ketchikan and uh, we, uh, we had a few problems and we got, because of being over there and we got got out of it and I started getting involved and after I quit traveling I came back home in Ketchikan in 1977 from the pipeline then I joined A&B in 1981 and have been involved ever since and my mother got me to be involved in the last day brotherhood and my auntie Emma Williams and she was almost 100 when she passed away I asked her the question how long, how long am I going to be in A&B auntie and she said a lifetime you join your name be for life. And she's right, as my mother and all my friends and their, their family joined, it's a lifetime of commitment. Okay. This is Priscilla Schulte and the crew that was uh, uh, when we went the last time. And the reason why we were on the island is that there was a documentary done on Mybridge's picture. Uh, and Mark Schaefer, who's from California, was put together a crew to come to Alaska to do a documentary. So we went to um, Mud Bite Clan House and I did the discussion about what he said. What do you think they thought when they saw the uh, exposures and people think there was conflict? I said, no, there wasn't. We had a treaty of secession with the Russians, which passed on to the United States and all the obligations they didn't fulfill with the natives. That's why we have. Uh, we never had treaters. There was there was uh, obligations that were had to be fulfilled, including uh, land claims, which first started with uh, Clinker Haida, and they got theirs and uh, finalized in 1959, which started the Clinker Haida Central Council in Anska, which is 1971, and still today they still haven't fulfilled some of the obligations with the Vietnam veterans, which were involved in to get, procure land under the. Uh, 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 Native Allotment Act of 19, uh, I think it's 1907. So we're working on that now and we're involved in that. So we were on the island uh, to talk about how, what we thought and how we felt about being back home really. So it was, it was good, okay. So that finishes our, um, oh, there's more my, my wife says, I'm sorry. 
Okay. We had a, a cultural camp and uh, we worked with uh, Diane Gubatayo uh, in the schools. It was an enrichment program. And we went up there to do class, a class on uh, showing our, our regalia and some of our, our, our tools that we used to the kids that were up there. And some of the kids were, they were um, work, working through uh, some problems they had, uh, identity issues and things like that. And some of the boys were, were disruptive. Uh, the two girls on the one side are from the tribe, uh, my, my wife and my, my niece. And uh, there's another niece of mine there. Her name is uh, Trinity and Lena. But the boys, uh, they weren't really, some of them weren't really participating and then one of them particularly didn't be in the class and he was he left the area. But curiously enough, when we started our songs and beating the drum, he came into the circle. Because that Aboriginal or traditional ancestral, whatever you want to call it, heritage that we have is very powerful. And he calmed down and he sang the song, they handed him, uh, something to to shake so they could uh, keep the beat and they they stayed and they sang the song with us even though they never heard the song before and it made us feel really good. Oh, this is my favorite picture. Uh, we went after in 2009, 19, we went to Ward Lake uh, right outside of Ketchikan. It's, it's a forest service area where the, the park uh, is uh, where people go to enjoy a afternoon picnic. We had a cultural event out there where we, to celebrate our finishing our, our, our camp. And you see those uh, regalia, and my mother-in-law helped with those, those girls make those. And uh, little girl was uh, from Klaquan. Her heritage is Klaquan and my sister was teaching her, her the songs and she was in, she was grinning away and enjoying it, and that's her sister right on the left side. And but she didn't shy away. You know, we're, lots of us are real shy when we learn this language because it's it's not exactly easy. But if you feel like it's important, you will you will learn how to say the words, and they're actually much easier when you're younger. Us at a later age, we've uh, acclimated our, our our accent and everything else to English, and it's difficult but kids can really move if they get taught. So that's what uh, we do. And anyway, uh, there I am in the back with uh, having a good time watching. Uh, so we'll move on to the next picture. And this is all of the kids together. And they have their regalia on. They know the, the songs we're trying to sing and they, Every one of them made their own drum. And the form lines were taught to them by Nathan Jackson and my brother, Norman Jackson. And they uh, got the, wet, the, the skin and we put it in, uh, in water and let it sit. And they came to, came to class and they stretched it and stretched out the, the the bindings on it so the drum would be tight and shrunk up and then they, they drew on it. After they learned firm lines, we had a template and they, they learned what colors to put on there and we started out with the raven. And there's a there's the eagle there as well. Uh, there wasn't too many eagles, there was a lot of ravens. But they got together and uh, really had a good time and I really appreciated the parents who were patient and uh, got their kids to class. And this was our last full event that we had was before the pandemic came. That, that's my family and me. This was, uh, and the Ravens, Tom and Cuddy. That's, uh, we went to the governor's inaugurational festivities for Walker. And so we're part of the dance group that danced. And my nephew is Kagwan Chan from the Eagles Nest Health 
Chuck Goodigan. And uh, my sisters that were on the left side, she's there in the class. She's a teacher, knows all the songs. And uh, I'm, I'm the head of uh, my clan, so I was up front. And my brother Jimmy is right behind me. You see his ear. And right on, right behind my sister's drum is Joe Buchanan, who's one of the head people from the Gonic ID. And right beside me on my left side is Governor Walker's wife. So we were out there uh, having a pretty good time at the inaugural. Uh, enjoyed it. And uh, it was good to get together with the family. Yeah, this is uh, my mother, Chate, and uh, he must be telling a pretty serious story there. Um, or she's telling a joke. <laughs> but when I was uh, watching her teach, uh, whoever she was teaching, she spent a lot of time away from uh, her family, my family, us. And now I didn't really, under, you know, I really didn't get involved in that until uh, maybe um, the mid 80s, 1980s. So when I did, I realized it was pretty, pretty nice to know that my mother can teach and us stuff we should have known maybe, but because of the, when they went to the school with, where it was, was discouraged that when she got back, she was sort of, you could take was indoctrinated and then we, we just didn't learn it. And later on, she started continuing it because uh, it needed to be continued. Otherwise, uh, without their language or your culture, or even your land base, or even if it's symbolic and you know it, it's a sad situation. So my mother was very involved with that. And she, she worked very uh, diligently with uh, KIC, with, with uh, Sheldon Jackson, with UAS, with uh, Priscilla Schulte, and, and not on here as a Forest Service. She worked with the Forest Service because they were doing projects in conjunction with uh, UAS and we did a lot of a lot together. And you see, this is the Forest Service. Uh, we were going to Tongas Island. This was the first time I went there. My mother was in, well, I think she was uh, in her 70s, you know, and, and that's, that's William Krishnick and, and his wife. And they're, they're coming along and William Kusnick is from the, the, Cape, the, the Sinia corner, Cape Fox. And uh, he, he was the one of their head uh, from the Cape Way D side. And so we're going over there and, and uh, I, think we, uh, I can't identify where they were at. It looks like there's houses behind them. So we must be coming back. So they stayed active. They didn't just uh, sit at home um, pulling their thumbs. She, she was always out there doing something. As you can see, there's me. I'm really young there. I'm on the left side. And my wife asked me, what, what are we cooking? I said, looks like we're cooking clams or something. I, I can't remember. But we were out. I went on a trip with them for uh, uh, cedar bark. Went to get some cedar bark, and, and uh, my mom was always in that red hat. I can tell this is uh, in the '90s because the hat was a Tungus tribe a hat we gave out uh, ap after we raised the pole. I actually have a bunch of those left. So this must be in the early '90s, and one of the field trips we made, and, uh, and I really enjoyed it with. Uh, at the Forest Service with uh, John Audrey, who was adopted into the Take Way D, and, and Priscilla Schulte was also adopted into the Take Way D because on her, on her daughter's side, there are relatives to the Tongas or the, or the Raven, so we had to balance that out, and we did. So, move on. Oh, this is my, my brother's grandson. And his name is Milton. And they call him what? Alex. They call him Alex. And he got he, he got he went to the cultural camp and he he got uh we had dancing then and he 
he really liked to beat that drum and see that drum was moving. You can't even see the drum beating so hard. <laughs> and we're going to show him that picture when he grows up. And his mom made him a little vest and a little apron. And uh, that is really good because you're, you're showing the intent uh, to, to, to want to learn the language without any resistance. They just, it's part of their life. And I like that. He's a, he's a great grandson. And, uh, he's on the bear side uh, through his mother, or the raven side through his mother, I'm sorry. Okay. And this is our last picture we took before the pandemic, actually. This is Elizabeth Pradovich Day, uh, 2020. Because that was predated uh, when they locked everything up in March. So this is in February. And this is the Tongass tribe members that we have and uh, our friends too. So on, on the left side is David, David Jensen, who is the head of, head of, the, of the Raven's house in Cloak. Uh, and then the Paul Young on the left side in the front, he's from Kassan. His wife is standing next to my sister with the drum. Uh, and that's Irma, Irma Young, and she's Navajo. Very, very good friend of ours. And uh, they came back to catch can. So and my nieces are behind my my sister. And my nephew is way up on the top, which and his kids. And we really enjoyed this picture and we had a good time and so we take the picture and, and uh, pass on the fact that we're meeting and having a good time. So this is a, the last slide. So we'll have it turned off. And uh, I don't know how much time we have left. So thank you so much, Richard. That was a wonderful presentation. Were there any were there any pieces that you had that your mother had made that you wanted to show folks in the audience? This is my hat. This is the one remember I told you this is this is made of beaver and the bear clan on it. And that continues a, a legacy I'm really proud of because that was how my, my ancestors were. And she made two of them and I wore the first one out. So I really treasure this one because this one has all that beadwork he put on there. And I said, I told him, I told her mom, I can't keep the hat on because he made the beaver hat. Be prior to this, it just was a, a round, uh, like a round cylinder, it kept falling in my eyes. So she thought about it and thought about it. And she saw that she, she got a baseball cap <laughs> and put the baseball cap inside, cut off the, the front part. And then when I put it on, it never falls down. See that is really, really nice. Get that on there, right? But when I put this hat on, you know, I'm putting it on my ancestors and it's a celebration. And uh, it makes me feel like a complete person. And now that, that's the main point in all of this is that when we dance, as men and women, we feel complete. That's our heritage. That's our atu. And, my mother made it, so it is very precious to me. And uh, I'll never lose this. I watch all of my stuff. One, one thing you should do is uh, if you have regalia, don't loan it out. If it comes from your mother or your grandmother. Because you, even if you want to, I, I don't think that some some people, meaning family members, not others, but don't know the value of it. Just, uh, it's precious. So this is the collar that my mother made, which has the, is it has the killer whale on it. And she did all the bead work with the leaves and uh, some of it, I believe it, Dennis knows more about that. Is that floral or is that, it's a floral pattern with, uh, with the old style uh, buttons on it. And I added the ermine. I like, I don't know, I just like the ermine. I thought it had a good touch to it. And you put it on and boy, after I put all this revealing, I'm really, you're really hot. <laughs> but I don't mind because I'm dancing for the, 
my clan. And, you know, a long time ago, with this, this is an old style uh, pattern. It's not those fancy patterns that you see now. I have one like that's fancy. This was done a long time ago, before before they, the, 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 the buttons, they used dentalia. Or, or they had abalone they would cut up, but that's a dangerous stuff, really, abalone. So they had to be careful with that. As a powder that can really hurt you. So she, she got this pattern from one of the, the blankets we have in our, in our uh, collection. I have over about 100 pieces of uh, come from Tongass Island that I'll have to uh, begin to take care of real soon. And uh, they're put away in, uh, in totes and make sure they're kept dry. And we have uh, uh, really old stuff. Anyway, my mother put this together and um, I've been using it because I enjoy this pattern. Do you have the fur blanket? Okay. Anyway, we found, uh, my wife thought recent vest making and my mother worked with uh, KIC and put together a book about how to, to uh, accomplish that. And they wrote it down in pictures and uh, this was done with the Johnson O'Malley funding they had in KIC. I even saw this on, on sale on Amazon. <laughs> Somebody stole one of these. Oh yeah, another that helped her out back in the 70s was a gal named Carol Hendrickson, very helpful to her. And uh, of course, Norma Jean Dunn was helpful in, in doing the editing on this. Uh, and you had uh, Valerie Stanley, who was a uh, uh, take, take way D from the Cape Fox. And uh, Ken, Ken Keita was from Kowak and Don Allen was Haida. And this is a really important book to me. This is the story of her trip to Chickman River. When she was young, she would go to Chickman River with all her brothers and sisters to go for summer because they had to put up food. So it was a little, we did a little play out, out on War Lake with uh, our class. And we were part of the, a tour with the, the first city players in Ketchikan. So we, we did a play out with my mother having gone to, to, um, to uh, Chickman River with her family. So she went with her six brothers and she had and I, that I know of, she had three sisters and, and they went to, including herself, they, Mama Clint and uh, Auntie May. Oh, and there's four. And, and they went up there and they carried about half their household. And it says a big cast iron boot, pots, fry bread, enamelware, big crock containers and, and jars. And my brothers packed huge traps for bears and small traps for beer and, and marmot. And, and rank, rank. And they went all the way up to Beam Canal and up to Chickman River. And that's in the Missy Fjords. And so they spent the whole summer there putting up food. So she was asked to carry water half a mile and uh, to the camp. And they said a, a, had a three story um, uh, summer camp, which was which was bottom was mostly for, for, for fish. As I heard, it was uh, for about like 300 fish. And they'd sit there all summer smoking those fish and then they'd have to jar them and pick berries and, and that was their lifestyle. And now today, when you look at what they were doing and I look at how Americans eat, some of the, what we're eating is not good for you. Like if you eat meat, it's got red dye in it, which is no good for you. Probably some hormones. You eat, you eat wheat products that are full of all kinds of uh, preservatives and things that make your bread look good and swell up. But what we ate was uh, from the land, much like uh, pioneers of America one, a long time ago. They just ate what was, what was uh, for, for you without all, all the other stuff. That, the end result for us is today we have chubby people. If you saw that picture of Tongass Island, all the natives and the, a lot. Alaska Natives and Americans actually were that thin. <laughs> now we kind of beefed up a bit, including myself. I lost a lot of weight because of the pandemic. 
I was up to 182 pounds, as you know, so now I'm lo way less than that. But, but just how you, you know, you're trained to expect things and they give you these fast foods and actually more than you can eat. So my mom had a rule for eating. She said, 20 minutes, take your time eating. And by 20 minutes, you'll be full. If you eat too fast, you don't know you're full. <laughs> so if you take your time, eat. that was good training, actually. So yeah, that's it. Do you have any more? That's about it, except for this vest. I've got to show you this vest. This is vest is just finished last night. My my brother Norman did the design. It's a it's a bear. I could come back yet. He did the design and back and that's a bear. Because last year I helped him with his uh, fisherman's uh, COVID funding and he showed appreciation by giving me a design. So my wife decided, well, you should have another vest. I have my my sister-in-law said that. He was the actual royalty, <laughs> but I, I I appreciate it, you know, the best uh, because it's it's who we are. And my brother put this together as an exclusive design, and, and that's ongoing uh, perpetuation of the heritage. And what's really good about it is my wife did it a long time ago. Your your in laws did your regalia. It would put it come out at the party. Was, was paid for at parties. I got to do a party because I got to confirm my um, my position now. And since COVID, I haven't been able to do that. So when it gets better, I'm going to do a party. We'll bring this out. So I have time for questions now if you have any questions. Richard, thank you so much for your presentation. This is really tremendous. It's so fun to hear all these stories and remembrances of your mother and everything that you've done in Ketchikan and your family's history. Um, I just had one question and then I'll let other people chime in. I was just curious, you know, once everything is back to normal, of course, and you don't have the same kinds of limitations, do you know what you would like to accomplish with the youth that you're working with that you haven't had a chance to pull off yet? What, what project do you really want to do that you just haven't been able to do yet? Well, one of them is a better uh, story of my mother's life and uh, story of the Tongass people. I think that because, you know, I'm, I'm, get, I'm getting into the facts that I believe and uh, affected us. Because uh, we're one of the five villages that didn't get land claims. We suffered in that we didn't have any cultural heritage uh, facility through a corporation. See, Alaska does have that, but you know they they, they haven't really come down here. And I'm not, I'm not only addressing myself, but the other villages might feel the same way if they if they were landless, and even if they had the land claims. So I thought. If they ever resolve the land claims, uh, would they really address the Tongass? So I decided, no, I'm going to address it. We're going to address it. Uh, we we'll facilitate it. We may not be experts, but we'll look at it and try to find the information with respect to you know acknowledging the other clans and tribes and nations, because we have a real, real, uh, a real bond between each other. Uh, we hold on to each other and respect each other because there are times when I, mean, I hear stories when, especially from when I sat with Louis Kit Coon on the ferries and they talked about one time there was a funeral in Heidelberg and they couldn't get there, couldn't get uh, the person's casket home. So somebody in Sackman volunteered his boat brought him over. That's what we're about. We got a lot of feelings, you know, we do that every every day. Help each other out. And they don't have to ask. We gotta see if it's necessary. That's what I see this going, you know, we help each other out and acknowledge each other and, and 
And I see that happening even outside of the tribe. Uh, last year, Ketchikan City Council member called me up and said they wanted me to indigenous people. They asked me to write a simple phrase about that so they could do it every meeting at the city council. Now they do that. And so does the school board. And then that was a very instrumental in my really looking at the, or what we were doing because they noticed that we had incorporated so that I think there are good things can happen in the future, but you have to stay busy. I have a question. Hi, Richard. Are you going? Are you guys going to be doing the culture camp this summer? Well, we, yeah, I think <clears throat> we had some. Uh, we had two sources of uh, funding, and we still have money left from one of them. Yeah, and I think that. Um, we'll set up a, we'll work with uh, Priscilla Schulte because boy, is she good at planning. And she's on our board of directors and so is Gail and, and my wife, Chase. To sit down and plan this out and, and discuss what's, what, what, what's the need. What's like, kind of like you go through SWAT, you know, you look at what your needs are, your, your threats or your opportunities, things like that. And then say, what's the priority? And, um, and we'll do that. In there. One of them is that we haven't done yet is a, we're working with a, with a Naomi Michelson and actually with a Trixie Bennett at times, and she's from Wrangell. They both clink it on plants and what they were used for and how we can continue their use. Because uh, I remember when I was little, I, was, I got sick and my grandma gave me some plants. And uh, they made me well. It, it, was, in the old, it was not something that wasn't bought in the store. She went in the woods and picked some plants up. And it, she would put it in the gravy, and it was kind of sweet. I, didn't, I never knew what it was, but it, I started to feel better. It's an uh, interesting story about me. Um, when I was born, my, my, my brother passed on, and my grandmother, uh, he, there were still old beliefs of. We believe it as people, you might not know this, but there was some talk about reincarnation, about our people coming back, but they were only coming back to the village. Well, my grandmother decided that she would be, come back and my brother passed away and his name was Richard Harris Jackson. So I came back as Richard Harris Jackson. And I always think about that, because that's that cultural link we have. Uh, come back to be better and you know, do better, remember uh, how to treat people and. This is part of it. So um, I'll volunteer to be one of the helpers at the next culture camp you guys hold. Yeah. Well, you were really helpful in getting us incorporated, but not to mention at the AMB, she wrote my notes for me or typed my notes. <laughs> Had to get up in front of everybody and, and make a the conclusion of your year, a report. And so I had it in the courtesy and I walked up to Gail and she typed up my notes. That's um, Gail, Richard, I'm Barbara. Oh, just Barbara? We <laughs> sounded like Gail. <laughs> well, Gail's actually hey, next, Richard, with a question. So we'll take one more question and then we'll, we'll wrap it up unless anyone has any real pressing questions. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Yeah, I raised my hand, Richard, so. <laughs> this Gail. This is Gail. Thank you so much for the presentation and all the great work you folks are doing through the nonprofit. I wanted to ask you a question on how you learned some of the more traditional trainings in your role as a Nakani or a, a clan leader, if you could touch on that. Well, first, thing, thank you, Gail. That's a good question. I got raised by my father. Maybe we don't want to talk about why, but I did. And he was a Kaguantan from the Cow uh, Hit. So whenever he talked to us, he had to look in, in the face. He told clan stories from up north, even though we were here. And so we learned about the value of um, the values that we, we project 
that you know, Dr. Shovaloff has uh, put on in writing. So my father really was a hard worker and uh, cared for his, his boys. And then later on, I learned from my mother, even got deeper. But along the way, there were people, uh, first of all, my mother, when I got involved in the 80s, I started to, uh, she asked me to come to the event that they were having, so she, she said, to just say, you know, I'm at, she said, I'm at your feet. Me, she said, I don't mean that you're stomping on me. He said, you cannot walk without me. I'm your bare feet. I never forgot that, the, that respect I have for the, the cause that are teaching the culture comes from the mother, not, not my uncles, my mother. And, uh, and, they, oh, and my father taught his, his stuff, his clan, and my mother's, my, my, my uncles from the bear side want to teach us men, manly stuff like, you know, hunting and stuff that came from the bear side. Or it would be done together, but primarily from the clan side. So my mother told me I had to do this stuff, to talk. And when I first started talking, I had no oratory skills. I'd break out in a sweat, I'd worry. I, I think a lot of you may relate to this because it's, it's, it's more than just saying no and walking out. It's, it's your duty. Not an obligation, it's a duty. You stand up and talk for your, your family, your clan. So sometimes when I first started, it would be very short and I'd get up and I'll give you an example of when I first started learning. I went, I, went, I joined the AB. Ed Thomas he was the president of the AB in Ketchikan and I was the vice president, brand new. He's, he had something else to do and I had to go to Juno. So they got this, uh, Department of Administration uh, commissioner there, and we were talking about jobs for natives. And, and Barbara Lewis came up to me, and I, I was like cringing because I was new, not 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 able to converse in public. She said, "I need you to ask a question, Richard, and we'll write it down for you." So I got up and shaking and sweating and trembling. I said, "Why aren't you hiring natives for in the state of Alaska?" And Barbara came up and said, oh, it was a good question. I said, it didn't matter how you felt, it was a good question to ask. And, and that was training from, from a woman. She was really good. And later on, training came from your grandfather, um, Judson Brown, Shalkakuni. We had that pole raising in Ketchikan, and I didn't, we raised the pole, didn't know what to do, so do the party. So I called up your grandpa. He said, I'll be there. And him and Cheryl George, the head of the Ravens of Deshiton, his son-in-law came and they helped us. And we, we, we had a really good event. And uh, later on, you know, my, my brother was ahead then, uh, kayak, butch, butch, we call him Butchie. So he, he was always uh, very uh, helpful with my brother. And when he passed on, uh, a couple of years ago, he named to succeed him in front of Harvey Shields and Saturn. So it's not like you go after these positions, it, it happens. It's your, you know, whether you, you can't know the future and when things happen, they happen. Good things will happen to all of you that are here and you won't know it until it happens. Thank you, for the question. Thank you Richard. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, uh, Richard. This has been absolutely wonderful. And, and thanks to your wife too, Janice, this has been so fun. I appreciate everybody who, who tuned in today for this wonderful talk and um, we'll keep in touch. And thank you so much for sharing. This was just incredible. Everything, the PowerPoint, the photographs, the pieces, you, you are quite a team. So thank you very much for your time and for everything. Yeah, could I say one more thing? Um, I, I see Emily Moore is on board and uh, her, her dad was really involved with my auntie. Aunt, and I just am glad she's here to listen to the conversation. And uh, my, my auntie, Emma spoke highly of, of him and uh, his work. 
So good to see you. Thank you. Have a wonderful weekend.